From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 36, recorded on April 7th, 2024. I'm Vincent Yellow, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to have a look at the latest column. Today is Tuesday, and it just dropped this morning. The misinformation business. So let's start, Paul. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic, you write that the anti-vaccine movement was thriving. Well, why is that? Right. I think um, the, the, they had a lot of money. I think we, the anti-vaccine movement found its message with uh, individual freedoms, uh, bodily autonomy, uh, pushing back on mandates. Don't I don't want the government to tell me what to do, and that message really worked. It gave birth to groups like um, you know America's Frontline Doctors, which were supported by the right. Groups like Texans for Vaccine Choice, and many different states had that. And that that don't mandate vaccines message brought in a lot of money. Uh, from public and private donors, and that uh, that really fueled their um, their movement. And what was the effect of this anti-vaccine movement at the beginning of the release of COVID vaccines? Uh, how did it affect vaccination rates in the U.S. say compared to other countries? Right, we were the worst among the G seven nations, meaning nations that are relatively wealthy dem- democracies. Um, we hit a wall at roughly seventy percent immunization rates. There were thirty percent of Americans who just simply chose not to get vaccinated. As a result, estimates are between two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand people died unnecessarily, and they died unnecessarily primarily because they got bad information, bad information about how impactful this pandemic was, and bad information information about uh, the the side effects of vaccines, which were often mischaracterized and misrepresented. So you write about the, an organization called the Center for Countering Digital Hate. And uh, first, tell us what that is. Right, so it was a group that spent a lot of time dissecting um, those uh, 12 persons or groups who had the biggest impact. And they, they estimated at least 70 percent of the misinformation and disinformation that was out there came from these 12 people or groups, which the New York Times ultimately called the disinformation dozen. And because many of these groups are um, charities, they have to report exactly where their money comes from. And so they just went through all those those documents to find out exactly who they were, where where their money was coming from, and how much money came into them during this pandemic as compared to pre-pandemic. And it took off, the amount of funding took off logarithmically. So you go through a number of these uh dozen misinformation people, the top dozen. And let's let's talk about them because I think people need to know who they are and what they do. So first, who is Joe Mer- Mercola? Joe Mercola is the most successful, I think, alternative medicine entrepreneur online ever. He's incredibly successful. And his his connection to this was he saw an opportunity. Um, here he would offer drugs to treat your COVID, like quercetin or oleander leaves or any of the other things that sort of were put out there. He had a a part of his website was called Stop COVID Cold. And he basically linked to the alternative medicine industry to then promote his notions. He, he, I, I think that this is the biggest surprise to me of all of this misinformation is who funds these people. And, and for the most part, the funding comes from the dietary supplement industry, which like them um, puts forward information that isn't often isn't backed by scientific study. The, 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 this industry, the dietary supplement industry, was to some extent brought under control by the T- Dietary Supplement Education and Health Act of uh, 1994, where they were no longer allowed to make specific claims. In other words, you couldn't say that Saul Palmetto shrunk your prostate if you had benign prostatic hypertrophy. You had to have a vaguer uh, a statement, something like supports prostate health or all the many products that are out there that support heart health or support immune health, even though there's no specific data to, to show that. How about Sherry Tenpenny? Who is she? Right. So she's she's a, a DO who um, is very powerful in terms of getting her message out there. Um, I, I guess she's most famous for claiming that the, uh, you know, that the COVID vaccines caused you to be magnetic. 
um, and testified in front of legislatures, state legislatures, who were considering whether or not to allow vaccine mandates or mask mandates. Because if you're trying to push back on mandates, what you do is you say, how can you possibly mandate something that causes, causes harm? Or in the case of Sherry Pen- Tenpenny, caused you to become magnetic. Then we have Charlene and Ty Bollinger. Right, so see, what they represent to me is, is um, the point of all this at some level. I mean, what do all of these people have in common? They're chaos agents is what they are. They sort of disrupt things. By putting misinformation out there, they disrupt things. And so if you look at Charlene and Ty Bollinger, there they were at the insurrection, you know, on January 6, 2021, um, just a couple blocks away, putting out their anti-vaccine message. And when the, the gates were stormed at the Capitol, they just said, look at this beaming Look at the patriots here. We're fighting for freedom, freedom from the federal government, freedom from the FDA, freedom from the CDC. And that's, I think, what links all of this. Del Bigtree, too, who's from the Informed Consent Action Network, was also there, um, you know, saying, you know, I wish I could tell you that Tony Fauci wasn't lying to you. And so that's it. It's, it's, I think, you know, medicine is frustrating because there's many things we don't know. There's many things we can't do. And I think that's often where alternative medicine comes in. They say, you know, that's the what your doctor doesn't tell you crowd. Okay, but we know how to treat these things. And um, it's hard to watch. Actually, the term alternative medicine, I think, is, is, is the wrong term. If, if an alternative medicine works, it's medicine. And if an alternative medicine doesn't work, then it's not an alternative. And we have Sayer G. Right. So it's another one who sort of capitalizes on this notion of I'm going to tell you what treats COVID. He he is he to me is famous for the fact that uh, he didn't think SARS-CoV-2 caused COVID. I mean, he didn't believe in in the germ theory, which is, you know, not theoretical. Specific germs do cause specific diseases. And finally, Mike Adams, who is he? Right. So otherwise known as a health ranger, he, too, is just out there promoting uh, pharmaceutical, uh, these these dietary supplement uh, dietary supplements, which is just an enormous industry. It's a multi multi billion dollar industry, and they've linked on to this anti vaccine group because the anti because both of them make false claims and want the freedom to make false claims. And look at I mean the alternative medicine industry also people like Tucker Carl's and Alex Jones are all funded by often the uh, dietary supplement industry. So after reading this column, I realize now, I always ask you, what is the agenda for anti-vaccine activists? And I realize it is to promote inf- misinformation to sell their own products. Right. And to me, that's the ultimate irony because they are the first to call other people shills. I mean, anybody who stands up for vaccines or vaccine safety must be in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry, right? Well, exactly who are who, who are they shilling for? I mean, they really are the shills. You can always tell when somebody's a shill because they're very quick to call somebody else a shill because they believe you can do it. I mean, I can never imagine being paid to say something I don't believe in, but they do. What's remarkable to me is that people are willing to listen to them and not uh, authentic sources like CDC and and so forth. Do you have any insight into that? You know, I, th- I think that, that there, there's a notion out there that that there the people in authority aren't telling you the truth. That there's there's a, a curtain behind which um, you're not allowed to peek. And, and I think what these people are perceived as doing is pulling back the curtain and say, look, look what's back here. Look at all this conspiracy that's back there. And I think it used, we used to term, use the term conspiracy theory as a pejorative. Um, but now I think it's just part of the mainstream. Look at la- the lab leak theory. I mean, uh, all the evidence is on the, the side of an animal to human spillover event. But two thirds of the American public still believes in, that it was a lab leak because it's a very compelling conspiracy and conspiracies will always be compelling. Well, certainly if you're, if you have COVID and you take some, some uh, product uh, that hasn't been FDA approved or even subjected to a clinical trial, I mean, you could die in which case then you would never, you would never have any regrets, right? But uh, maybe you would naturally get better. And maybe that's why people think that some of these things actually work. Right. Well, you could see it uh, during probably what was the most embarrassing uh, moment in Trump's uh, of all his press conferences regarding COVID when he argued for, you know, that bleach, you know, that bleach may be a value. And, and you know, and while it is certainly true, I think that, you know, that, that bleach may be able to, uh, to decrease the quantity of virus on a surface, uh, 
um, because you often wash wash down laminar flow hoods after you've Mm -hmm. been in there with the virus. But ingesting it, (laughs) I don't think so. And so, so much to the point that Lysol, I think, had to put out a statement saying, please don't drink our product. You know, or the notion that UV light could, you know, could... uh, could uh, inactivate the virus, which which is is true, but you know not not it's not going to get past your skin. I mean, when you go outside and you get a sunburn, you know you don't sunburn your lungs, and you know because you, you have to. It can't work internally. That was, I think, honestly, the most embarrassing moment. Watching Deborah Burks during that press conference, looking down, hoping the floor would open up in front of her. <laughs> what, what can we do about this? It doesn't seem to help to expose these individuals. They've been exposed over and over by you and and by this. Center for Countering Digital Hate. It doesn't seem to make any difference. Is there anything that can be done? I actually do think there is something to be said for for looking where the where the money is. I, I think that people are, who are quick to see conspiracy are also willing to to believe that those you know like Robert F Kennedy Jr. are getting source or having sources of funds that that he's not so quick to tell you about. I think does lessen his credibility. I think Andrew Wakefield, for example, who was you know when he published his paper in 1998 in the Lancet claiming that the MMR or measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused autism. I think where he tended to lose a lot of credibility. When when people found out that he had actually put in a patent for a safer measles vaccine, and that he had done that before that that that, uh, that paper was published, which is to say that he could have financially benefited, that did hurt his credibility. So I think that listeners need to understand that these individuals who promote misinformation, not just anti-vaccine but other kinds, they make a lot of money. Uh, they get wealthy, right? promoting their alternatives. Much wealthier than you and Twiv are getting when you put out good information, yes. Well, we don't get paid, right? We're a nonprofit, so (laughs) nobody, that's why I don't take advertisements to avoid the appearance of a conflict of interest. But um, yeah, truth doesn't sell. No, that's exactly right. That's the point I was making. Obviously, I know you guys don't get paid any more than I get paid for doing this. It's just, um, it's all the money is on the other side, which is why it's so hard to counter it. All right, you, we will put a link to the original article in the show notes, and you could read all about it there. And you can find Paul Offit on Beyond the Noise on Substack. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vince. 